Michael, welcome to the Ultra Habits podcast, man. It's great to have you on the show. I'm stoked to be here with you. Thank you for including me in your community and, you know, with your mission here. Yeah, no worries. So I came across your work some time ago, I think on the Rich Roll podcast several years ago, particularly around your work uh, with Compete to Create, your your joint venture with the Seahawks. For the, our audience that, you know, they're not aware of your work or what that actually was, can you break that down in terms of how that niche initiative came about and actually what was that work uh, what it, what you know what was entailed in that work sure happy to i'll give a quick flyover just to give some context because yeah. it'll start to make more sense yeah um so working backwards first is that initiative was a partnership with the head coach of the seattle seahawks where he had 30 years of deep understanding of how to create cultures high performing cultures or cultures that permitted or supported high performance, however you want to look at that. And um, it was about year two into my work with the Seattle Seahawks with the club that, you know, he comes flying out of his office one day and he's like, can you feel what's happening? And, uh, you know, without, without like really knowing what he's, he what, exactly what he was talking about, but it was about the energy in the building. He says, we got to just write this down. Do you think anyone would be interested in what we're doing outside of sport? And, you know, yeah, like there's something happening. And what he was talking about is my best practices in the psychology of excellence, psychology of high performance, if you will, and his best practices of how to bring many people together and get their noses and toes, toes is pointing in the same direction, like that idea. When you're in it, it's electric and you can feel it. So we just started scribbling on the back of a napkin. We turned that into like a whiteboard. We turned that into like a just a, a really loose deck, if you will. We shared it with the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, and he was like, man, that's exactly what I would love for, for my 200,000 people mm. at, in, his com in his companies. It was Microsoft, or it is Microsoft. And so it just kind of took off organically from there. We ended up winning the Super Bowl that year, which is, you know, the championship in the NFL. And um, it was awesome. And so that's, that's kind of the, the, the end frame. And that business now is called Finding Mastery. We went through a bit of a change there. Uh, he's no longer in the business. When COVID hit, I was either going to have to s move my family up into the bubble or, you know, stay down in Los Angeles. It's about a, a two and a half hour flight from where the, the club trains. And we made the decision, like, now is the time to go full on for, you know, psychology. Now is the time. And so I ended up doing that. He's doing great up at the Seattle Seahawks. Just had a, a fun little text with them yesterday that, you know, they're just getting camp going and the seasons, it's hard to believe the season's already ready, uh, you know, geared back up and ready to go. So, so that's what the business is. And then the, the context is that my training, I'm classically trained as a psychologist with a specialization in sport and high performance. And then I spent 20 years in hostile, rugged, high heat, you know, environments of speed and accuracy that are required to be great. And uh, about 10 years ago, then I started, um, I went back to traditional sport uh, with Coach Carroll working in American football. So that's, that's kind of the flyover. Why did Coach Carroll initially engage you? Like, was something going on at the Seahawks? Was there a challenge in terms of their performance? Or did he just see the value in terms of what could be potentially unlocked? Yeah, I, I love that you bring it up that way, because... I think that that's, that is not the way, I, well, first and foremost, that's not how he was framing it. There's only three things that you can train as humans. You can train your craft, your body, and your mind. And anybody that's leaving the mind up to like, is there something wrong? Is there something that's not working? Is there something that, you know, like, do we need to address something? It's just old. It just, it's not how it really works. And so... If you want to be world class as an individual, as a family, as an organization, does not matter to me. You've got to have some real skills, technical skills, some sort of craft that you're invested in. Your body has to have the carriage that you have has to work well for that craft, whatever the, the, the purpose of that craft is as well. And then you got to train your mind. Right. And so it's all three of those 
full tilt, getting after it. And sport is great about training craft and body. And the progressives, the, the true avant-garde leaders have always invested in the most sophisticated science available for the mind. And, you know, we're about 60 years into the science of excellence from a psychological perspective. And uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful discipline. It's an amazing body of research and figuring out how to apply that research is the art of, you know, sports psychology. I want to unpack that, Mike. So, you know, I, particularly with my kids, I'm really focused on helping them find something they love, right? So like we're continually engaging in different crafts, like, you know, from music to sport, I'm an endurance runner. You know, my daughter's in ballet, she's doing all kinds of stuff. My son, he's not very sporty, but he runs with me on the trails, but I'm, he's into music and we're just continually experimenting because my view is that if they find a craft they love, the pursuit of that craft will mold their mind, body, spirit. How important is it for an individual to find a craft they love in terms of the pursuit of self-mastery? Like, is that fundamental? Well, I, okay, it's a, it's a cool question because you don't have to have it. You know, you don't have to love what you do, but imagine your life if you didn't love the things that you did. Like, it's, it's just different. I, it's not one that I want to live. It's not how I want my loved ones to live. That being said, is um, there is another way to look at it, which is you can love the craft, so to speak, like let's call it guitar playing mm -hmm. or building a business, whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you can also love the way it feels to unlock, the way it feels to learn, the way it feels to be part of something special. And so that that's like the substrate of any technical thing that you might do so if the technical thing is playing notes on tune in a rhythm that you know whatever feels good that's the guitar technicality underneath of it if you've got those things attuned the craft is actually less important so the underneath is i love learning i love being part of something big and special and amazing with big and you know dynamic challenges and i love the way it feels to unlock learning and and doing something new i love being on the edge so then the craft itself is secondary. Sometimes it's easy that I think what happens at a young age or like as parents, when we're supporting kids at a young age to find something that they love, it's really what we're saying is find something that you love the way it feels to get better at. You like that challenge. And it's not the thing itself. It's just that thing makes it, it's so inviting that it makes the learning, um, enjoyable as well. Yeah. So I, you know, I would reverse engineer it a little bit and I did the same thing with my son. You know, I exposed him to everything. And I was like, why, why, of course, like everything. And I wasn't sure he was going to find something that he loved, but he did, he does love the unlock and love learning. So he can port that into anything. I think that's brilliant, Mike, because what you're talking about is cultivating, I suppose, a growth mindset, right? Like if you're, I think that that is probably one of the most crucial elements, you know, in terms of what we can instill in our children, because I think that drives adaptability, right? Like if someone is interested and curious and pro learning, they'll figure it out, right? That's exactly, it does not matter what it is, whether you're in a compromised um, social situating situation or you're in a boardroom or you're in a living room or on a pitch, you know, it's like, do you love figuring things out? And if you happen to be naturally attuned to the way it feels to contort your body or your mind for that craft, meaning that there's some, there's some predisposition to talent there. And you've got the foundation of loving the unlocking that's taking place at the edge, at the struggling edge. That's, it's, it's awesome when you can figure those two things out. And so there's no, it's not confusing to anyone really is that you've got you and I and everyone listening has a genetic predisposition towards something and getting enough of that into place with this love of learning and then investing deeply in the technical aspect of it. Like those three components are really important. And then it gets even more exponentially important on the growth arc when you get around people that will support and challenge you. So the environmental conditions 
for relationships and otherwise are really important to get right as well. Mm. And then I'll just, I'll just kind of last point rel related, but not necessarily right on the nose here is that the idea that we need to find something we're passionate about and then go do that thing was kind of your earlier point, I think. And I would rather help somebody find how to be passionate in anything that they do. Right. So I think the trap of passion is that I can only be passionate when I am playing the guitar or when I'm home with my kids or when I'm building something, whatever it is. I, I want to live with fire and zest and aliveness and that that leaning into life in every moment, not not just the ones when I've got a guitar in my hand. And I don't know why I keep talking about guitar playing, but maybe there's some subconscious uh you know, maybe you maybe you want to become a musician, Mike. <laughs> oh, man, I, I love the craft of music. I, you know, if you were if you were to come back, like if there's a um, reincarnation thing, or you get to come back, what would, what would you want to come back? Because musicians pretty high on my list. Yeah, I think I think for me, and this is going to sound super weird, I think I would have enjoyed a lifetime career in the military. And there's a whole story there. Um, I think for me, the the performance orientation with the risk. I have a high appetite for risk that I think I don't necessarily get from business and, and daily life. And I kind of like to intertwine the risk, the physicality and the athleticism. And I think like the military would have been a really good form for that. But anyways, I would have been underpaid well, and probably maybe dead. So no, I don't. I don't know. Yeah, no <laughs> kidding. Very cool. There's, there's like five types of risk that we tend to think about. So physical risk is only one. You know, there's others, there's financial, there's emotional, there's social risk, there is um, ethical risk taking, you know, so there's other risk taking as well that you can, you can definitely get your fix in. Have you seen the Netflix film, The Alpinist? Alpinist? Alpinist. Yeah, yeah. it's, yeah, it's incredible. It, you know, like I he is incredible. It, it was incredible. So you know, I'm an Alex Honnold fan. I grew up not too far from him. I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, I see this movie. What's your take on him? Like, you know, I was on, you know, a text group with a friends of mine and just giving your experience with athletes in the, you know, the world of performance. Like, people like, oh, he had a, a, a death wish or like he had an unusual aversion to risk. Like, how did you see him in terms of what he was doing? Right out of my graduate training, I spent uh, my first gig was in traditional stick and ball sport. It was hockey. Mm. And I grew up in action sports. And within, I think it was like nine months, I was like, I can't, I don't get this. I don't get these man made rules, you know? Like, and so I went back to my roots and I spent the better part of, I think it was about 15 years in action sports. So, Alex and Conrad and big wave surfers like Kai Lenny and, you know, fill in the blank, like they're different. And what's different about them is that there's an honesty in which that they line up their vision of the way they want to live their life. They line it up with the actions that they take on a regular basis, where most people don't get to that honest approach to life. And so... Yeah. Right. It's like most of us talk about like, man, it's really hard and I don't kind of get life and it's a grind. And and they think that those people that are living outside, exploring, adventuring are like different, you know, like there's they're different in, in a fundamental way is that they have co-created the life that they want. And many of us are are actually not doing that because that risk. So they risked early in life, many of them. And you don't have to risk early. Like Alex was climbing at a very young age. Kai Lenning was almost born on a surfboard. He's one of the great big wave surfers in the world, great, great waterman. And when I, so when I watch them, I go, yeah, they've lined it up. Their thoughts, words, and actions on a regular basis. And they're walking the talk, talking the walk. And they think we're crazy. They think we, you know, we're living inside through pane glass windows, like they think that we're living a crazy life. We look at them and say, what you guys are doing is crazy. And so I, I, I look inspired 
And we need them on the frontier to remind us and show us what's possible. We need them to, you know, open us up to the way that we're living for an honest reflection of our own lives. And what most of us do is we look at them and then just dismiss it quickly. They can't love their mom. They can't love their children. They're selfish, you know, SO whatevers that, that are, you know, just pursuing this junky adrenaline path, which is my case. My experience is not true. That is not my experience. They're incredibly skilled. Like Alex Hanold says to me, uh, he was on the Finding Mastery podcast and he said, I don't consider myself a risk taker. Mm. My environment is consequential, but I don't take risks. Those risks kill me. Like I'm yeah. skilled and calculated. What was interesting, I think, with this movie was when Alex, because Alex obviously was on it, right? And he was, you know, there were clips of him on it and he was speaking. I realized in this film that Alex was portrayed and has been portrayed more of a risk taker than I think he actually is. And I think in this movie, it's framed more as Alex is an athlete and he really assesses his risk and he's very prepared. And I think that that message had been lost, mm -hmm. but it, it really came to the forefront in The Alpinist where I think what was interesting about the Alpinist was how they framed his climbing is always unplanned and on the fly and therefore kind of always pushing the bounds of mortality and having accepted mortality. Like, you know, every morning he ate his last meal, so to speak. So that was interesting, I think, and, and really took us to the edge, but the, just the mastery in terms of craft was phenomenal. The things he was doing, right? highest regard for how they align and organize their life and highest regard for the dedication and skill required to operate in those environments. When there is, there is no safety net, it's real. And the military, the military offers that. So I can see why you're attracted to both of these conversations. Some, some aspects of the military, you know, in the amphitheater war, it is as real as it gets. Um, and I don't want to dismiss all of the other military operators that don't go to combat, but it's, it's different. Mm. And so I think what you're talking about was a, a, a combative, um, you know, amp the theater of war as opposed to, um, administration. Mm. In, in terms of the barriers for people to be congruent and have that level of integrity and honesty, like, why do you think only a few go down that path? Like what's preventing others from actually going down that path? Well, at some, at some level you have to chip in and you have to say, this is how I'm going to design my life. And what <laughs> most people do is they follow the path from, you know, their, their, up, their, their parents or their neighborhood or the ethos of the, the country. And most people try to, they go to high school. So the ones that we're talking about, like the, the masters inside of action and adventure sports by the age of like 17 to 19 in that range, they've already chipped in early on. And like high school, I think most, most of the, the folks on tour for the World Surf League, um, I was fortunate. It was the sport I grew up in and I was fortunate to spend some time with, with tour or the athletes, I should say. Most of them don't have a high school education. They are the best in the world. So they chipped in pretty early. And I look at the, their life. It's, it's amazing. Like, you know, like there's no lack of intelligence. It, they earned their education in a different way. They've traveled the world. They've smelt, seen and felt spices and dialects and, you know, conditions that are far different than most well educated people in the Western you know, world. I was working, I did some work with, um, I, I had a, a, a bit of an insight from the travel company. I'm sorry, the, the travel channel it's called. Yeah. And there was a show that we were considering doing that was going to, um, go around the world and expose some high performing conditions. And they said, this is an American based channel. And they said, not enough of us have passports. So like, yeah. I was like, really? <laughs> like, yeah, our shows are nationally based travel, not international. And I was like, wow, you know, so I say 
I say that because there's, they chip in early. They have world experiences. They're really curious about how to unlock something and they're pretty tribal in the way that they kind of move around the world. So that's why I think that that's, that's what the special ingredient is that they chip in really early and most of us don't. We follow the path. Do you think that these individuals that chip in early, their parents are different? Like they, they're growing up in a household that's supportive and broad and roomy and, you know, like there's a high level of experimentation or do you find a lot of these kids are going against the grain in terms of the traditional path with their families? I think it's the, a combination of both. Like the parents have an appreciation for getting to the edge and being a little off access and counterculture. And, mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean like, when I say counterculture, it just means like, wow, the world's zigging. I'm not sure that that's the right play. I feel like I need to zag a little bit. You know, like there's just a little bit of a, a different approach to, you know, trend spotting. And, and so the answer is yes, is that my parents supported um, action sports for me because like the, they didn't know better. They didn't go to college themselves. I was the first person to end up going to college because the action sport thing didn't work out for me. And so I use my own family as an, a moment here is that like they tried their very best and to, to support me and challenge me, but they didn't have a path that they knew was traditional and they didn't go to college. Right. And so when it came to making those, those nudges, they just kept supporting. Do you love it? Are you into it? Awesome. Are you having fun? Great. Where do you think this is going to go? <laughs> you know, do you have a backup plan? Uh, not really, <laughs> you know, so, so my, my unique experience in life was that it was just kind of a lack of uh, options, but more just genuine support. And then when I look at like the surf world or the climbing world or whatever it is, their families are usually pretty involved in it. And I think they're when, and to your earlier point you made when we started the show, like allowing your children to pursue mastery in a craft that is not traditional my view is the very act of allowing them to do so and the skills that that child will develop on the course and on the path on that craft is you can replicate that they'll be able to replicate that that like that's far more advantageous to me in my belief than them just following a traditional path like the internal skills and mechanisms that they're developing i.e a young person that pursues big wave surfing and they get to, you know, relatively high heights within that craft. And for whatever reason, they don't make it. Those skills and that mindset and those attitudes would be transferable, right? You, you would think it is you and I looking at it, it. It seems so evident. However, it has a lot to do with like the transition and the mentoring in that transition. <laughs> and there's so many applicable skills that will transfer the self-reliance, the uh, ability to be resilient, the, the ability to be a self-starter and highly motivated, right? There's so many. And same with traditional stick and ball sport, being on time, being a great teammate, being reliable, you know, um, being able to work in a leadership structure. There, there's so many, but most have a difficult time in that uh, post-retirement from first sport, if you will, from the thing that they really got there when they've done it at a really high level. And so they've mastered, let's say some craft. It doesn't mean that they've mastered themselves. They might've over indexed and mastery of craft <laughs> and under indexed and mastery of self. Mm -hmm. they've, they've mastered the ability to be in a high heat, high speed environment, but not necessarily know how to transfer it over. And so that, that mentorship or that transition period is really important. That's why one of the things that we do when we're really thoughtful, all right, let me, let, let me answer that and then I'll, I'll, I won't lose my mind here on the point I want to make, is that when we're really thoughtful, when somebody has been in the league for a, a bit of time, then we start to have the conversation about, okay, what's next? And when we get, when we do that right, it, it decreases anxiety and it increases freedom. So there's a plan. We can see the vine that we're going to grab, you know, next. And we know we're not going to just die on this vine. Mm. The other part of this is that 
this happened in the NBA is that the, my mentor in graduate school ran a research study and she did early mentorship or early transition conversations. So when rookies came in and she would have a conversation with them about what's next. And then there was three responses. I don't know. Okay, that's cool. What do you want to do? You know, I'm not really sure. You know, can we talk about this later? Okay, that's one. The second is like, hey, I'm not even thinking about that. I have no, why would I think about that? I'm here. Are you kidding me? I can't, I can't think about next. I got to be all into what I'm doing. Like it is eat, breathe, sleep, whatever. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the other, the third response is, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you, you brought that up. You know, like I really don't know. And then the first group and the last group. So the, I'm not sure. And the let's, let's sort it out. Let's go for it. That group, when they actually went and did exposure to all, to second careers, like I've always wanted to be a pilot. Then the team would actually support like getting them to meet a pilot, you know, like, or go and sit, you know, shadowing some a pilot doing something, whatever the thing might be, pilot or business or whatever. That those people, like I said earlier, there was a decrease in anxiety while they're playing and an increase in overall freedom uh, in the way that they experience stress. That's remarkable. And so, mm -hmm. but if, if, if you catch somebody and they're like, I don't want to do it, you, you can't force it now, <laughs> right? Even research isn't going to really change that behavior for people. So, um, so I, that's, that, that is, so that, that's an important part of the transition. And then the other part is, um, I said I wasn't going to lose my mind and I'm kind of losing my mind. <laughs> it's okay, say? but let's throw hypotheticals. Like, let's talk about like Jordan or Brian, right? Like, I believe that they, I'm assuming they would have fell in the second category, all in, particularly Jordan, I would imagine would have fell in the, the second category of completely all in. If you start to think about options and you lose or you start to, not lose, but you start to create other opportunities, do you lose that singleness of purpose? Well... Okay, the, it's a cool word you brought up, which is purpose. So let's, let's open that up, but I'll address your point, which is you can, you know, there is something undeniable when you burn the boats and you're like, I'm not going back. There's something undeniable about that type of all in competitor, all in pursuer of, you know, what's next. It, but that can slide into desperation quickly. I don't want, I know I'm not great when I'm desperate, but I know that I am, I am better when there's an urgency and an intensity and there's a purpose. And so, so it can be a distraction and it can also work against you. I, you we've got to know the person. And like my wife, you know, she loves the craft of dancing. She grew up dancing and she loves the, uh, at a super high level and acting mm -hmm. and she always had a second option. I always had something that was pretty good that was working. She was also an entrepreneur and she was building a, her business as she was uh, towards the later stages of her, her career, her first career. And she wonders if I wouldn't have had a second option, would I have gone the extra mile and would it, you know, would it have been different? So I, I've seen both sides of it and I think we got to know the person. I think more options are better. Dude. I think it's healthier. I think we work from a, a a better place. I think we're more of a tribal community member when we're that way, rather than a desperate kind of like, I'm going to go hunt by myself. You know, you guys back up, get out of here. I don't know what you're talking about. Like, I don't know, like I, I'm more inclined to the other, but you said the word purpose. And so burning the, the bridge in the boat is not, does not align with purpose necessarily. So purpose is like, I'm committed to something far larger than the thing I'm doing now. I'm playing in the league or I'm doing whatever I'm doing. I'm building this business for a purpose. And it's not to look at me. The purpose is not to make money. It's to, it's to make money for some reason. And when you can get purpose lined up, just about everything changes. And so when you're really clear about what matters most to you, you can almost endure just about any pain. So when purpose is smaller than pain, pain will win. But when purpose is larger than pain, then, you know, the, the opposite is true as well. And we'll do just about whatever it takes. And so you think about your kids. 
purpose is really clear. Like you're going to protect them. You're going to take care of them. You're going to mentor them. And you would step in front of a, a you know, a semi truck, right? If your kids were doing something in, in, a, in about to, you know, be in a dangerous situation. When purpose is clear, action follows. Yeah, I, I think that's interesting. Like for me, I've spent the last two years engaged in different things that I've been kind of looking for the connection. And as a person that generally likes to double down on one thing, it's really tested my level of patience. Like I, I've had the show, I've started a business, but for a long time, I didn't know what that business was going to look like. And I was doing other types of consulting and stuff that really wasn't aligned to what I felt my purpose was. And I was experimenting with different things to see which was moving me in the direction. And that was challenging to not know wholeheartedly what my purpose is or was and how I was going to pivot from what I was doing, which I was no longer really keen or interested on. And it's been a two, two and a half year journey and it's now culminating all together. I would say that I was able to stay on point because even though I didn't know the purpose or my purpose, I knew I was moving in the direction and, and that was keeping me going and that's been keeping me going. And I think that I didn't, you know, it's, you don't, in my view, always have to know the target, but it's good to know where you're aiming. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you I, know what I mean? I'm glad we're talking about this because remember I said I, I lost my memory. Yeah. But yeah. Like I, it, it was just re-triggered here. We're, yeah. And so we're talking about, um, and I wrote about this. I'm really excited. Just last week, I turned in my manuscript for my book. And I'm Excellent. really jacked about it. And so one of the things, so it's called the first rule of mastery. And the essence of the first rule in shorthand is to look, is to work from the inside out. Yeah. And, and so then the book is all of the practices and the things that get in the way of that. And one of the things that we deconstruct is that there's a thing called purpose based identity and then performance based identity. And so I'll, I'll open those up in a minute here. But what we we're talking about earlier was that when an athlete is young and exceptional or a kid is exceptional at anything at a young age, they begin to fuse their identity with the thing that they do. Yeah. And so it's called identity foreclosure. And so it can happen later in life as well. And so this is one of the reasons why, you know, let's say an adult goes one of the one of the greatest fears is public speaking, you know, snakes and public speaking of all things. And so not in Australia with snakes, we get used to it. Yeah. You guys are pretty good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, public speaking is so, so terrifying to people yeah. for one reason, because the fear of what others will think of us, yeah. we call it FOPO, fear of people's opinions. FOPO is so strong that we stay away. We stay away or we heat up or we contort or we conform to a, to have a sense of uh, acceptance or to avoid rejection of other people. And it's an awful way to go through life. Yeah. Most people's prime driver is to belong. Mm -hmm. And the fear of not belonging is so great that they don't step into the edge. And I can recognize it in myself as well. Yeah. yeah so, so a performance-based identity is when your identity is wrapped around what you do. And some like early in my life, that was me. And it helped to get me really good at the science. But I was anxious and miserable and not great to my, my, my partner. And like, it was just, you know, like, I, the world does not need the 28 year old Mike. Right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, I, I, and I don't, my, none of my loved ones need that, that version of me. It's probably made you wiser, though, right, Mike? Well, uh, it didn't make me wiser when my wife and now I'm talking a couple times about her. Uh, we've been married 35 years and we were seven years in and she said, uh, I love you. You're a good man. I don't want to be married anymore though. Yeah. You know, like you're, you're spending more time on like you and getting better at this, this thing that, you know, you're getting after and like, I just don't feel like I can flourish and be me. So, you know, the whole thing came to a skidding halt. We got our ass in the therapy, did some epic work there. And, you know, we've been married 
been better married since that point. Yeah. And so it wasn't the experience that gave wisdom. It was doing the inner work with a wise woman, which is our, our, our psychologist. This woman was incredible. And she just held the mirror up. She didn't let us, you know, mince our words. She's like, well, what do you mean? Well, what does that mean? <laughs> well, why would you say that? That's interesting. <laughs> you know, like there's nowhere to go. <laughs> so yeah, you know, except yeah, for yeah. deep, deeper, you know? know. And so yeah. Yeah. anyways, I say that because um, per- there, there's a, there's a bit of a formula for purpose and it's got three components. So the first thing, it has to matter to you. Nobody can give you purpose. You have to do the alone work. What matters to you? It's part one. Part two, it has to be far bigger than you. So it's being part of something that is grand. And three, it's, it can't be instantly or immediately solved. Like there's a time horizon to purpose. And it's, it's not a goal. It's not like the vision of who you want to be. The purpose is like, what are you doing here? Like, really, what are you doing? And that, for me, even with those three components, felt so overwhelming that I had to thin slice it and say, well, what is my purpose as a father? I can, I can get my arms around that. It's like I thin sliced it based on role. What is my purpose as a husband? What is my purpose as an entrepreneur? What is my purpose as a global citizen? What is my per, and I can keep going down the list and I start to thin slice it and write all those down. And then I can push my chair back from the, t- from the desk and be like, okay, I got to just metabolize this. I got to look at this and see, what is the common thread? Like, what is my flipping purpose in life? What am I doing here? I don't know how long I have. What am I doing here? And that's really what purpose is. It doesn't matter. It's big and it's down the road. And if you get all those three components together, you got something now. And then and once, you, once you know it, RJ, nobody can take it away from you. Mm. How about and, it? And, and do you then try to aggregate that to create alignment in all those different yeah. verticals? Well, I tried to simplify it. This is what I suggest people do is like, it felt too big for me to do the yeah. big, my big life purpose. So that, that's why I did the thin slicing. And I didn't try to aggregate. I ju- it just helped me to get clear. And then, yes, it is clear about the big purpose in life. And mine, mine is really clear right now. It might change, but it's so clear. My purpose is to help people live in the present moment more often. That's it. Super clear. And you say, why? Because the present moment is where wisdom is revealed. We need more wisdom in this world. It's where all things that are beautiful and amazing are experienced. It's also where things that are painful and difficult are experienced. Mm. And when we're in the present moment, we can experience both of those. Okay. And the third is it is also where high performance is expressed. And I get paid to help people do that. Right. And so, and I want, but I don't want to be just the high performance person. I want, I really deeply value the fullness of the human experience. So that's my purpose, help people live in the present moment. And there's such rich information there and experience that takes place when we're can string moments together. Mm. So that's it. So now that guides me. Yeah, my mentor always says that life isn't what you feel or think about it. It's what's happening in front of you, right? Like, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's interesting. Like, it's very easy to, to kind of get lost in conceptual thought and frameworks and feelings and emotions. And I'm very much an existentialist in the sense that, and I have to be because I'm, I'm in recovery, right? Like, I, I was a do or die addict, you know, and, and for me, the path to mastery wasn't one of choice. It was one that I unwittingly you know, I got on the path initially just to save my life. Well, you know, but you could have white knuckled it. <clears throat> you could have not done the inner work. You could have like, and you probably did at some level, you, you, you know, you're dry drunk in whatever drug you were using. But like my favorite people are the ones that go, um, they go down into the honest truth and then they make a re- uncommon commitment to be their very best. Yeah. So there's a progressive nature. I, I think you're nodding your head because you're like, yeah, that's me. I went down, like I got the honest, you know, examination on a regular basis. And all I want to do is like, I want to be my best to help others be their best. And like, let's go. So it's so refreshing to know that that's where you're coming from. Oh, big time. I mean, for me, you know, I was talking to Mark Devine about this the other day, like I'm involved in a, a Guinness book, uh, world record attempt that Mark's done as a team. I'm doing it individually. And we were talking about 
kind of just performance and the mindset around that. And I was reflecting on when I initially got sober. Like for me, it was like, okay, I just can't live like this anymore. I don't want to die. And two things happened for me. I, I went back into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, but I got a mentor who was an entrepreneur who gave me a pathway, a craft, which was commerce, business. And, and, and through business and pursuing excellence within that craft, I became better, faster, stronger, smarter. Also amplified through the inner work I was doing through recovery. And, you know, that's when I got into your work. And, you know, that's when I came across what you were doing. And I was oh, like, cool. wow, okay, there's a whole world here. Cool. Yeah, that is awesome. That is awesome. Nice job. I just want to ask you, how do you define mastery? And is it a place that we can actually get to and live and stay there? Or is it a moment to moment proposition? Yeah, I'm more interested. I'll define, I'll give you my best working definition of it uh, that I can understand to date. And I've been studying it for a while here. Um, but I'm more interested in the path of, you know, the path of not like being on the path. And um, I'm less interested in the path of high performance. That's where I was for the first kind of 20 years, you know, like I'm far more interested in mastery. And so we really can't tease apart mind and body, you know, like Descartes, I think kind of screwed us up a little bit, yeah, but yeah, but like to sometimes it, it's really helpful to pull things apart, to, to look deeply in one section or one part of it, but they really are infused together. So I'll, I'll do the same type of um, thing here with like mastery of self and craft. It's the relationship between the two that is part of, is the path really for me. But mastery of self and mastery of craft, they, there is a difference. So mastery of craft is like the technical skill on demand, artistically so under any condition. And so what, what do I mean by that? Is that the conditions can be whatever they are, and I can still artistically express my craft at the highest level in such a way that it's exciting, it's thrilling, there's spontaneity, it's unbelievable the way that it feels to do it. Like that is, that's the mastery of craft. And then interestingly enough, like I don't know how this quite fits in my framework right now, but game recognizes game. So masters recognize masters. Like there's something there that I think I haven't folded into a framework yet, but there's a, there's a, there's a tell there as well. And then the other part of mastery of self is like, it's almost the same thing, which is independent of conditions. I know how to line up my thoughts, words, and actions. And it does not matter the external environmental circumstances. I know how my thoughts and my words and my actions uh, on a moment to moment basis um, are in alignment. And so that takes incredible awareness and incredible psychological skill to do that and to navigate that. I think the true masters, their external world does not dictate their internal experience. Now, when you combine those two together, mastery of craft and mastery of self, it's freedom. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it is freedom. And so high performance doesn't have the freedom I'm talking about. They might, they might drop 40 points in an NBA game and, and be recognized as the, an all-star. Um, and be an absolute train wreck, be depressed and anxious and pissed off and like an absolute disaster in other parts of their life. One of my early experiences in elite sport, it was a cage fighter hmm. and um, uh, the ref put his arm up. He won. He was, uh, he got the belt put around his waist and he said, when he got off, when he got out of the cage, he, he said, um, it lasted about three seconds, Mike. And then on that third second, the only thing that I could feel and think was like, fuck, I got to keep doing this. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. so there was, it was what he experienced was not joy, which by the way, is a mistake. Um, looking for joy post success. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, a, that's a mm -hmm. devil's dance right there. Mm -hmm. But what he had was relief. And he's so anxious and like so needing approval from dad and so such a hard grinder that he got relief for a moment that like maybe it's going to be okay. And then he realized he's got to keep doing it. He doesn't know anything else. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'll uh, give you another I, example, just one more example, because I want to paint the picture like thoroughly. Uh, National An Olympics National Anthem is being played. She won the gold medal. Um, she's crying again on the uh, on the top step. She gets off and the whole world is like, oh, look at her. Like, this is amazing. Like, she's feeling it. This is the American or the U.S. spirit. She was she was American. This is the U.S. spirit. Da, da, da. Like, that's oh, wow. Amazing. She gets off and she said, you see that? I said, yeah. She goes, you know, I thought I was going to be different. I thought this was going to change me. I'm still miserable. So the external does not change the internal in the ways that we would hope it will. And so, um, and that goes true with success and uh, let's call it like adversity. There's post-traumatic growth as an option and there's post-traumatic stress as an option. And both are fine. You know, like it's, it's how we work with stress. It's how we work with experiences and, and how honest we can be in our, in our responses and, and reactions. None of us are getting through this world without trauma. We're small T, big T, I don't know, but we're mm. all facing it. And if you can square up with it, you got a chance to work with it, as you well know. I, I think it's interesting that you, you, you closed on that because it's very easy to leverage trauma to perform, right? Like, like trauma is a very potent tool in the sense that you defined performance not necessarily a holistic view on well-being, but more so like performance in your craft. I think like if you look at Tyson when he was young, like there's a whole, I mean, these cases out there every day is to individuals leveraging trauma as a means to drive performance. And I think the danger is once they're successful and the world gives them their accolades, they ego inflate and then they pursue that forever. Yeah. Um, you know, this hustle hard mentality. Mm -hmm. So I've been fortunate to work with world's best across multiple disciplines for a couple of decades. There's no, there's no one way. There's no secrets. There's no tricks and tips. There's no hacks for sure. Um, there is a shared language. And again, game recognizes game there. Like you can, you, you recognize the language that somebody has, the way that they organize their life. Uh, around whether it's high performance or what I would consider a step up of, of mastery. However, I don't know anyone that's not working hard. So this message, hustle hard, it's like we, that message is, is dangerous in a way because you wouldn't, you and I wouldn't go into a gym. And if one of my, if I've got a sciatic thing happening and my left knee's kind of cranked and um, my right, my right shoulder, I'm working on like an old, you know, rotator cuff tear, you would not load a bar on me and say, Hey, listen, we're, we're going to work hard, you know, put this on your back, strap a couple plates on here and let's go to work. I'm just waiting for a recipe to blow something out. Yeah. Right. So, you, so hustle hard. I would say, um, work hard. Yeah. I'm about it. Okay. It's a prerequisite, but knowing the dysfunction that I was talking about physically, it's like the emotional traumas or the anxieties that we have. Go to work there so that you can really load yourself. And I, when, when people said this to me when I was a little bit younger, like people that were fully committed to the path of mastery, they're like, Mike, you have no idea about your potential yet. You have no idea. You're doing great, but you have no idea. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I understand what they're talking about. I had no flipping clue because I was loading dysfunction. <laughs> I was... I was working towards more hollowness and more anxiety with more accolades, you know, with, with more quote unquote external successes. There is freedom. Psychology will offer a way. Keep doing what you're doing, brother. You know, like helping people work from the inside out. Mike, I think that's a brilliant way to start to land the plane here. I uh, really, really thank you for your time. It's been an amazing conversation. Always ask our guests just a couple questions around their personal habits and with you obviously we'll focus on mastery what's one or two things that you do on a regular basis in the form of habits that help you on the path to mastery yep cool thank you so i'll i'll be i'll answer the first couple like super concretely and then uh, something a little harder to get your arms around for a habit but concretely i've got a morning routine it's got four steps it starts with one breath 
and maybe more if I'm feeling it. It starts with uh, one embodied feeling of, of gratitude or more. Mm -hmm. It's And then the third is an intention. So I use my imagination to imagine how I want to feel and be later in the day. And then the fourth is I just pull my sheets off and I just take a moment to be where my body is. And now I'm training presence. So that could be a 60 second drill or, you know, 16 minute drill. It, it depends. So that, that I'm purposely waking those four things up in the morning. Um, the other habit that I have is this is super concrete is that anytime I cross a threshold, I take a moment, I take a beat to, to recapture the person that I want to be at my highest most authentic self. So I never, re never is too big a word. Rarely do I come into a threshold. Like I don't come into my house on my phone. I come into my house, into my sanctuary, being the, the husband and father that I want to be to the people that, you know, yeah. that live there. So yeah. thresholds matter. And I take moments for thresholds. That's um, brilliant. Yeah. So that, that's super applied, but the, I, this is the less esoteric or the more esoteric, the less maybe easy to practice is honesty. And it's, so it's honesty with myself about um, my experience that I'm having. And so as a habit, I want to be great. So the relationship that I have with experience is really at the center of my whole life. And if I am numbing or dumbing stuff down that is not honest, then I'm, I'm playing a secondary game. So what I want to do is I want to be really honest with my internal experience and the experience that's happening outside of me as well. So there's, there's this, like this constant, if call it a habit of, of being a tuning fork. Am I full of shit right now or am I being honest? And so that helps to guide, um, that helps to guide me. It's a habit that I, I hope I don't shit. Yeah, that's brilliant. Michael, where can our audience learn more about you, particularly your upcoming book, man? Yeah, cool, man. Funny Mastery Podcast is fun. And so um, that's a that's a cool way to kind of get connected to a lot of things. But but I, I, I ask more questions like you did here. And so it's, you know, it's a good community and we love it. So Finding Mastery Podcast is awesome. The um, FindingMastery.com is a place you can see how we're taking best practices and applying them into, into business. And so that's a cool way there. And then the book, um, we don't have any pre-launch, any of that stuff yet. But if you get on our mailing list now, we're going to do some fun pre-launch where you're, we're going to load stuff up for, you know, folks that, that help support our, our thing. I, I want to sell books. I really do. Not because I want to make money, but I, I want to have a chance to write another book, you know, and like, and have, and create a wave around it. And I love, I love what we did here on this book. So yeah, hopefully your, your folks, um, you know, can put a little, save a little money and, you know, buy a book. I, I would like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a good thing to do reading we all yeah. need to read more all right michael thank you so much for your time man yeah i appreciate you yeah thank you for including me